Hello and welcome to Spaced Out. Quite recently I've been on a journey trying to figure out how to jolt the space industry to where it needs to be today. Oh, I just wish more people were excited about it. And I, I just feel this passion, this enthusiasm that my guest today has it needs to be spread all over the world. <laughs> so I came across this badass space leader called Rick Tomlinson. He is an active space entrepreneur and space activist. And today I'm going to find out more about how he's helping us open up the space frontier. Hello, Rick. How are you? Greetings, Earthling. My <laughs> <laughs> science fiction. I, greetings, Earthling. Well, I'm an alien, so. Yes, yes, aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to find out more about um, the work that you did on mm -hmm. the policy level. You were the one who helped Elon Musk um, be able to launch his rockets. Uh, so tell us how that came about. It wasn't just me. Okay. Um, I was part of a, a, an organization, a group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and in many cases, I was just a small part of, mm -hmm. of what happened. Um, and in fact, in some cases, I just happened to be there when it happened. You know, it's, uh, I was in the room where it happened. Um, but once in a while I did, I did stick my finger into the cause. So, uh, I will give you a bit of a history on this, um, and it, it is a history that is untold um, in many cases. Um, and it does start with uh, with uh, kind of growing up in the, the 70s um, and um, a generation that came up during that period. You know, we've we'd seen this the cold war was going on you know you know today here in the u.s kids dive under desks for uh for shooter incidents uh back then we dove under desks because there was supposed to be a nuclear war mm -hmm. um you know we had um radical transformation going on we had the, the civil rights we had um the anti-war movement we had uh, what we used to call Tricky Dick Nixon as the president. I mean, it was crazy times, you know, sound familiar? And um, so during that period, at the same time as all of these things were going on, there was this amazing and incredible thing going on where human beings were flying out into the solar system and walking and driving and doing all kinds of things on the moon. Um, we had Voyager and Galileo shooting off into the universe. Um, and then, which is important for a child, we had amazing science fiction like Star Trek on TV. And, um, and so as a kid growing up, you're looking at these things going on and it's almost like you're being given a choice of, 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 you know, what it is you're going to create in your future, what you want to aspire to or, or avoid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a child too, you're, you're seeing these things happening like the Apollo program and the uh, the Russian space program, depending on where you're from, um, and you're watching, you know, Captain Kirk and Star Trek and, and all of this. And his hot ladies. <laughs> Pardon? And his hot ladies. Um, yes, I, I'm not going to, I'm trying not to <laughs> get it. I'm sure I will. Um, I was a boy after all. And <laughs> it's, it's that green skinned lady that just, hmm. Anyway. <laughs> So the idea, though, is you're, you're watching all of these hang at things happen, and in the mind of a child or a teenager, they begin to sort of uh, meld into to one image. And it, it's basically, oh, well, if they're doing this, then of course that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I want, to, I want to engage in that when it does. And um, so as we were rolling through the 70s, there was a couple of uh, really important things that happened in the, in the world of space. And one of them was that after Kennedy had gotten us to the moon and the astronauts had shot in what I sometimes refer to as the most expensive selfie in history, uh, which was basically an image that was designed to point out to the world that we were better than the Soviets. Mm -hmm. So frankly, after, after the, at the peak of the Apollo program, uh, landing on the moon, taking that picture, Buzz and Neil, uh, basically the game was over and, and the U.S. had won, supposedly, right? Uh, and that was it. So it was game over. That was the end of the program. Now, it kept going because it was, had been spread out by President Johnson in so many different states in the U.S. And there was a little bit of the Soviet program that was still going, too. Um, 
but it was meandering. It didn't really have a direction. Um, um, and it's very important, especially for your younger viewers to understand, there was no commercial space. There was no idea of, of settling space. This was all laugh you out of the room sort of types of stuff, right? Um, it didn't exist at all. And so along comes the uh, uh, um, NASA, which was again, looking for a program there. They've got all these important contractors that are making tons of money and they want to keep getting the money going. And so they're like, well, what do we do? And, and so they came up with a space shuttle program. Now at the time they were telling all of us that the space shuttle was going to fly 50 five zero times a year and it was going to be a hundred dollars a pound to go into space so if you do the math on that you start thinking wow we can do some pretty cool stuff up there if it's that cheap mm -hmm. and in the middle of all of this uh, a professor in princeton gerard k o'neill writes a book called the high frontier and in this book he basically says look go out into the frontier Use your imagination, use the, use the democratic system, use the tools of free enterprise, use the resources of space and expand human civilization. And here we are, we're watching all of this stuff and we're like, oh yeah, that's what I want to do. And he spoke to a generation of us. Um, and it was interesting because it went across a lot of different lines mm -hmm. and there were a lot of us out there who got into it. And, um, you know, it, it's, for example, there was a kid in school named Jeff Bezos who picked up this book called The High Frontier and started selling it in his little book club because he was going to sell books online one day. Um, he ended up giving part of his uh, graduation speech in, in high school, basically saying, essentially saying, I'm going to make a ton of money and then I'm going to go settle space. Um, then there were others, uh, like my friends I mentioned, who founded the International Space University, and they went out and did that. Um, and then there were a group of us, my group, um, and we, I, I actually started working for Dr. O'Neill. Um, I had founded a group called the L5 Society of New York City. We met on the Intrepid Aircraft Carrier, and uh, uh, I met these people that were talking about Dr. O'Neill, and eventually I volunteered. I basically told him, I'll sweep the floors, I'll do anything you want, just please let me help. And I started doing what you call in, in, in that part of the country, we were a reverse commute from New York City to Princeton and um, uh, started working my way up in the organization there. Um, now, what's important to understand about that is Dr. O'Neill and his essentially his partner, Freeman Dyson, the physicist, um, were incredibly kind people. and just very open they weren't full of themselves in any way um you know he may have been he had his eyes set on the stars but he was reaching back to to crazy kids like myself and saying come on come on you know and he listened he listened you know um i should tell you that i am not uh the child of a wealthy family i come from a working class family my father had three jobs he was in the military we still call him sarge but he also had two jobs on top of that, just to make the ends meet. Um, and so for a kid like me to sort of be taken seriously by somebody like Freeman Dyson and Jerry O'Neill, along with the others in that room, uh, when we would come to the conferences there, was amazing. It was, it was empowering. It was, it is, uh, I use a term today, I call it permission to dream. And the way I like to talk about it is permission to dream is not granted to you by the universe, it's something you grant yourself. But it certainly doesn't hurt to have somebody that you consider, uh, oh, you know, a, a guru or a leader to to help you with that by acting like the, by uh, listening to you, acting like they care or actually caring about what you say. So this this was basically how I got into it. Now, I will preface this, and I'm going on a bit on this tale. If if you if you want to talk about other things, let me know. I'm just kind of no, telling you. Beautiful. You know. um, I I watched the. High Frontier last night, and I couldn't stop crying for two reasons. Oh, yeah. Um, well, three. I, I felt very much connected to um, Gerald. Um, he's such a beautiful soul. Um, the other reason was because I'm worried about our future if we don't get to space fast. Um, and I was also excited about the possibilities that await us 
um, when you do get there. And I'm just getting emotional again hearing you speak. So, no, continue. I'm, yeah. I'm... I, I, and so let me go. I want to go back a tiny bit. You know, I talked about all that disruption in the 70s and that kind of craziness, and it, it was really true. Um, and, um, you know, the first time I heard of Jerry, um, and I've said this before, and uh, you know, I like to be very frank. I, I don't. I, I don't try and hide the bumps. Oh, I'm the same. I, I don't BS. I'm very direct. Right, right. Um, and so that's I, how I like it because life is short and I, you can't waste time or people's time. There's no point. You might as well be direct. And it's, right, right. Yeah. Or to, use, to use a wonderful British word, I have no time for posers. No, exactly. Right. <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, there I was and I was in college um, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was basically partying my ass off. I was having a wonderful time. And um, I thought I was always smarter than my teachers. I was always walking out of classes and I was the guy who would stand up and argue with them and throw down and leave. And, uh, you know, and uh, I look back now and I realize I was not really smarter than they were. Um, but uh, uh, I remember sitting in what we call the student union at my university at the time. And I was, I was frankly stoned out of my mind. I was like high as a kite and there was a guy on stage named Timothy Leary uh, who was known for you know being the king of acid at that time um, <laughs> but he was talking about this idea of building and we could talk about this later it's not a politically correct term now building colonies in space and he talked about this guy named O'Neill and I was blown away because I had been a science fiction fan my whole life I was an asthmatic child I created my world in the worlds of fantasy and science fiction and, and created myself using those models. So here I was seeing somebody saying, you know what, we could really do this. All right, so that's when it clicked for me. Um, it took me a while to become focused on it. And again, being this, I, I mean, I seriously, I, I started as pre-med and then I went pre-law and then I was getting physics and da 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 and I just blew them all off. And um, strangely enough, I ended up in theater at one point. Um, and I'll be honest about it, that's where the girls were. <laughs> and so, talking about the mind of a 21 year old, you know, so. Um, so the point is, I'm in there, and of course, what I gravitate towards was A, directing, and B, uh, tech. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm saying this because what happened was, as a techie, I found myself one day in the back of the uh, stage of the auditorium and we had a guest speaker a gentleman named gene roddenberry the creator of star trek mm -hmm. and i found myself alone with him for a little while and at one point i i said to him i said mr roddenberry i said this i, I want to do this i want to realize your vision i want to realize dr o'neill's vision i want to i want to make these things happen what what can i do and he said just stay the course study learn and never give up i said yes but i've blown off my classes i I'm, I'm not an engineer i'm not qualified i just don't know if, if i'll be accepted in doing this and he stopped and he said you know you know what i did before star trek and i i, I had no idea he said i wasn't an la police officer I said, what he said yeah i used to drive around in my black and white in the, you know, in the police car with my scripts laying on the seat next to me. And then I worked my way into doing Star Trek. He said, so you don't, it's not where you come from, it's where you're going that counts. Exactly. It's the and so those two inspirations, the physicist and, and genius of, of Dr. O'Neill, and then the vision and the, um, uh, just the forward leaning, go do it approach, of, of Gene Roddenberry sort of drove me forward. So skipping forward then, I ended up working with Dr. O'Neill. Um, and along with some friends of mine, um, we began to feel that there needed to be more, um, let's call it radical action to make these what things What were you happen. doing with Dr. O'Neill? Uh, basically, I went into the communications area with the organization. Um, you know, it was a very free flowing organization. So there was a lot of mind trading and stuff. And again, as I said, Dr. O'Neill was very open. And um, uh, so I found myself working on projects, for example, um, 
we started a project called the um, Lunar Prospector. Because one of the key things uh, at the time was we believed that if we could find water on the moon, that this would be critical to opening the frontier. And so we started a project as volunteers to create a thing called the Lunar Prospector, which would fly around the poles of the moon and look down in the craters and see if there was any uh, water. Um, there are craters at the poles of the moon, that have, the bottoms of which have never been hit by sunlight, which we now know have large quantities of ice, which is why Artemis, the US program, the others and the Chinese are all going there. At the time we didn't. So we, uh, we kickstarted that project. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, I was working in all kinds of different areas, but largely I was trying to do the outreach and education and get people excited about it. Um, but as we went along, some associates of mine and I realized that the political action part of it needed to be handled. Um, and I was working with a gentleman named Jim Muncy, um, who later became a co-founder with me of a group called the Space Frontier Foundation. And uh, Jim was a uh, right-wing Republican, came into Washington, was a congressional staffer, came into Washington with a guy named Newt Gingrich, who was the beginning of the, you know, the extreme side of, of the Republican Party, let's say. Um, and uh, later on, I hooked him with a, another fellow named Bob Werb, who came from the liberal left uh, a Jewish real estate family from upstate New York and is married to a social worker. And then there was me. And you know, one of the rules, by the way, was we never talked about politics. We had one vision and our, our job was to open the frontier. So what happened was I then started working on trying to create an organization in Washington where they could lean on the, the establishment mm -hmm. and start changing uh, the conversation as was later applied to it as a, as a goal, changing the conversation. Um, and you know, keep in mind, I started in a very naive position in all of this. I, I remember testifying at one point in front of Ronald Reagan's uh, National Space, um, I forgot what it was called, the National Commission on Outer Space. And uh, you should get a copy of the report of that book. It's, it's very beautiful. It's got a lot of artwork. Oh, where we're gonna go. It's called the National Commission on Outer Space by Ronald Reagan. Or I mean, I don't know if I have it here, but um, it has a great set of artwork in it by uh, Bob McCall, who painted that beautiful picture of uh, Buzz Aldrin on the moon that's in the entranceway of the uh, Air and Space Museum. Um, but anyway, I ended up testifying there and I was still grasping for like, what needs to be done? What do we need to do? I remember testifying, part of my testimony was that the problem was there weren't enough people who had been in space talking to the American people. And we needed to have more astronauts on talk shows. That was my solution at the time. And it, it, was, it was incredibly naive because that wasn't the problem. Now, what really was, was that there was a thing called the Aerospace Industrial Establishment that President Eisenhower had identified in the early 60s or late 50s. Um, and that, in, that is basically the, the contractors that make their money by doing contracts to the government. Um, and they have a vested interest in keeping the money flowing and prices as high as possible and as many projects going as you possibly can get. They have no interest in achieving an outcome because at that point they are, uh, they're no longer needed, right? So it's a cycle. They, they raise money. Uh, they create projects, they consult with government agencies, uh, the money goes into them, goes back to the political donors, which causes more projects to be funded, and off they go. Now, they also have a pricing structure, uh, which is called cost plus. Now, cost plus means that if, if you wanted me to develop a, uh, a lovely iPhone for you, and you're the government, I... Um, can bill you uh, in a way where um, I get to keep 10% of whatever it costs me to create this for you. Now with that kind of an incentive, why would I charge you $100 and keep 10 if I could charge you a million and keep 100,000? 10%. That is why 
all of the military projects in the U.S. are so expensive. That's where the million dollar toilet that you hear from, hear about comes from. So this is important. I'll get back to this in a minute as we oh, go through the lesson. <laughs> I love We're going through the lesson. So money, money, money. what happened was, we, <laughs> I'm on a roll. It, no, please be on the roll. <laughs> this is what I do. I'll be the rock. You be the roll. Go on. <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it. Let's make some music. Anyway, no, the point not. is. <laughs> so anyway, the point is that um, I started uh, floundering around trying to figure out what to do, and I, I created eventually an organization called the Space Frontier Foundation. Um, and these two gentlemen I mentioned joined me, and then we got a group of volunteers. Um, and we immediately started with a petition to return to the moon. Um, and this was 1988, the year before 1989, which would have been the 20th anniversary at that point. Moon in 1988. I know, I know, I just got aged. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm so right. to make you feel aged. No, I mean, because I came across a lot of the things that you did. Um, mm -hmm. um, what happened in 1988? the Space Frontier Foundation. Um, and it's just really interesting. A lot seemed to be happening around the, the 1980s. Right. Um, yeah, that's when it started. Yeah. So it's really now, I, know it's, I know it may be hard for you to translate the stone etchings of the mid 20th century into <laughs> modern words, but um, we went to Washington and we started working the cause. Um, we turned in a petition with 40,000 signatures now, keep in mind, this is pre-internet, so those were hand-gathered, and we turned them into then-President Bush, which led to his uh, initiating a, um, a first Return to the Moon program, which people in the space field call it the kitchen sink program, because NASA went out and came up with every project that they had, you know, and it made the budget so big that it died immediately. Um, how long did that take you, get, gathering all those signatures? I, I think it took us a year, about a year. Oh. But it was just volunteers, you know, standing by metros and stuff like that. Um, it was a way to organize. It was a way to get us going, to get us off the ground. It was an activist tool in a sense. Um, we believe that the government shouldn't be building buildings and driving trucks, building space stations and flying space shuttles. We believe that was a private sector job. Um, and so we became the first and only space organization to oppose the space station. So we were locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat trying to basically kill the space station at the time. Again, it wasn't we didn't believe in space, it wasn't that we didn't believe there should be facilities in space. We believed that, that this was not going to do it, that it was going to slow everything down, that this should be a private sector activity, not the government. Um, we got into uh, the early 90s and uh, I, I still joke about this occasionally with my friends who are NASA alumni. Um, and um, we got to one vote. We almost killed the station by one vote. Or as my friends at NASA said, they saved it by one vote. You know? and, and then we all laugh. <laughs> uh, but the idea, again, was that this was basically a, more of a money-making scheme for contractors than it was, than it had anything to do with opening the frontier. Mm -hmm. um, shortly after that, we were exhausted because we were a small organization. The only reason we had any power was because it was so close. And in any political system, you know, um, when you have, uh, you know, the, the, the liberals and the conservatives, and then there's this little party that's the tipping point, they get a lot of power. And that's where we were at that moment. Um, so, Moving quickly through the 90s, what was going on at that point then was Dr. O'Neill's message was sort of permeating. And the, the, the people we used to call Jerry's kids, um, we were starting to do things. So some of us were working the politics. My friends were helping create the International Space University and I was happy to help them uh, raise the early funds and get that thing going. Um, there were others though that were the engineers and they were starting to build stuff. And uh, so you're starting to see things happening, starting to bubble up, but it's early, right? So just off the coast, for example, of Texas, uh, former astronaut Deke Slayton um, and his partner, uh, David Hanna, um, flew the Conestoga One 
the first commercial rocket ever launched. Um, way too early. What yeah. were people building? Um, what were the engineers building at that time? Um, well, most of them were going for the rockets. Rockets, okay. And you said you're, you were raising funds for the um, for the ISU. So were there, were there people interested, like private investors, um, in investing in space at that time? Um, and how did you get them to do it? How well, did you get them to be a part of it? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting question you asked. Good question. Um, so I was working at the time uh, with the founders of ISU. I was not one of the three founders. I, I helped them um, with what we jokingly used to call agit prop, <laughs> uh, you know, propaganda and marketing. Um, and so I was shooting, actually we shot video productions and I think there are a couple of them still on YouTube. Um, we shot one on the deck of Star Trek Next Generation um, and had some cast members from these shows. Um, and it was all, it was about marketing and fundraising. This wasn't investing, it was a nonprofit. Keep in mind. Um, and same thing on the, on the private sector though, there was very little money, very little money. Deke Slayton, um, and uh, David Hanna were able to do what they did because David Hanna came from one of the wealthiest families in Houston. In fact, his family donated the ground on which Rice University, a, a large piece of Rice University sits now. Um, so it was very hard. You're looking for a needle in a haystack at that point of, of people who might have that vision or who, who read the high frontier. So it was very, very minimal. Um, but there were a lot of backyard people trying to get stuff going, trying to build, you know, I, I remember hearing stories of, um, there was one little rocket company um, that uh, Peter Diamandis and myself and some other people were in. And um, there was, it was just a little, it was called Microsat Launch Services. And it was just a little tiny rocket company. And there was some guy testing a motor out in the middle of, out in the West, I don't remember, it was Colorado, Utah, somewhere. You know, it was on a test stand and it fell over and it started chasing them around the valley they were in. You know, it was like, <laughs> it was a manager, right? It was just crazy time. It was like a cartoon. <laughs> yeah, it was like, ah, ah. But anyway, these, these kinds of things were going on and it, you know, it was those wacky people in their flying machines. Um, and as we got through the 90s, though, you know, we're, we're starting to get more serious, more and more things are happening. Uh, but here, here was the dilemma. While those of us who were focused on policy were saying this is the way it should be, mm -hmm. and this is what could happen, we still didn't have the proof. We didn't have evidence. You know, we, we couldn't point at something and say, this is it. We're just saying you have to change so this can happen. So we started passing uh, different parts, pieces of legislation and commercials space laws. Um, uh, I testified in 95 uh, in Congress, called for all transportation to and from the station to be commercially provided. All expansion and beyond the space station to be commercially provided. That wasn't because I was a genius, by the way. I was speaking for the team. You know, I'm speaking for everybody on our group. Moving through the 90s then, a, a gentleman uh, joined us, began to support us, a guy named Walt Anderson. And um, he, uh, he had been over working with the ISU folks, but he decided to come work with us in Space Frontier. And um, the words, you know, there was this Russian space facility out there called Mir. And it looked like they were gonna deorbit it eventually. It was, it was reaching the end of its life. They were running out of money. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Cold War had ended. It, it was just all of these things were going on. And um, so Space Frontier actually started a, um, an activist campaign called Keep Mir Alive, uh, because we believe, coming from the frontier ethic, that you should never throw anything away in space. Recycle, reuse, repurpose. And it, 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 it exemplified one, you know, like, this is a big thing to be throwing away. So during the course of that, I won't get into the details, but I ended up sitting at a private meeting with a gentleman who, at that point, his, he was a general named uh, Pete Warden. Um, and um, he had been to Russia and he spoke uh, about the cost of a progress, a Russian resupply vehicle. And it was a price I had never heard before. Now, now it was very low. It was under 10 million. And <laughs> The idea was, uh, in the background of that, Walt and I had founded a group called FINES, the Foundation for the International Non-Government Development of Space. 
and best job I ever had. Um, he had 25 million invested in dot coms. This is before the dot com crash in the late 90s. Um, and my job was to give away half of the growth of the fund over the initial principal every year. And I had an office on Ventura Boulevard. And Who or what companies or what products did you give it away to? Oh, well, so we, we gave money to IS, the Space University. Mm -hmm. uh, we funded uh, projects that were focused on space solar power. Yeah. Um, we funded uh, projects on asteroid processing. This was 1998, way before. Um, we um, laser launch systems where you would lose a laser to, to fire things off the ground. Um, and on and on. Oh, and then there was this crazy guy running around named Bob Zubrin at the time, who had been a Martin Marietta engineer working on how to convert Martian atmosphere into usable materials. And uh, he was trying to start a thing called the Mars Society. Mm -hmm. Now, Walt and I uh, wanted to, and, and all of us in the Space Frontier Foundation part of the world, we wanted to push NASA away from the Earth. In other words, get their hands off of Earth to low Earth orbit transportation and habitation. Mm -hmm. Get them back to what we would call the Lewis and Clark function mm -hmm. of going to the frontier, the far frontier, the edge. And here was a guy saying, uh, we, we need to go to Mars. So we decided that we would give him some funding to start the Mars Society and create a social movement to put pressure on NASA to pull away from the Earth to make room for the private sector. And so we gave him $100,000 $100, and he got it matched and created the Mars Society. And uh, so you can see that, by the way, if you look, they have a little facility up in uh, Newfoundland. Um, and if you look by the, uh, the entrance, you'll see a little blue F-I-N-D-S. And that was us. Uh, it's still there, I think. What happened um, to F-I-N-D-S? So what happened with it, I'll get there in a moment. Um, what happened with it was that we got started mm -hmm. and then um, there, uh, we came across this idea about low cost ways of refueling things in orbit, i.e. the Russian low cost vehicles. Yeah. And um, we, I did some math and, and with some friends and stuff. And uh, I went to Walt and, and had this conversation. I remember it was in LA, it was in a, because we were drawing, they had those paper, um, tablecloths and we were drawing and I said, would you like to have a space station? Well, he said, yes. I said, I think you, we can get one. And um, we started going crazy with ideas. We put on a little research project to look at how we would save the station. Um, and in the project, um, we had a guy named Joe Carroll who had worked on what are called tethers, electrodynamic tethers. And he worked with a Russian called Vladimir Sermentnikov. They came up with an idea of this long metal ribbon that you would dangle down from the, the Mir station and push electrons down it. And we create a magnetic field that would gradually push the Mir away from the Earth, which meant that you would need less fuel to keep it up, which would then make it start making it more economical. And so what happened was I ended up flying to Russia um, and uh, there's a film about this called Orphans of Apollo that tells. I watched it actually. Uh, you, there you go. Did you pay like seven million to it save was, the station? It was uh, well, there was a down payment. There were down payments and things like that. And there's so many fun stories with that. It was the craziest ride of my life, right? Uh, <laughs> so you know, I, 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 I remember going over for the first meeting, and um, for example. We roll in and a, uh, there were three of us there and they put us in this room and the uh, chief Russian negotiator comes in or, or the head of the division, he comes in and he's got two very, excuse me for saying this, two very beautiful uh, young ladies with him and then a, an, an older, more mature looking lady and they sit across from us. And he starts talking and they're all in Russian. His name was uh, Darechin, Alexander Darechin. And uh, it was really funny because they were going through the translator. The lady was the translator and all of this. And um, then on the second day, we're writing something down in English and he corrected our English. 
<laughs> no, I mean, we were we were in the realm of dealing with some big league hardcore negotiators. We were way out of our depth, um, but we kept going. And I remember walking over to the board and saying, you know, we want to start a company. Let's call it Mere Corp. And I paused for a moment and I said, now I want to make sure this doesn't mean like I hate your mother in Russian or something, you know. <laughs> That's funny. So the next day we end up getting called into the big room and there's Russian cosmonauts, the head of, uh, of Energia. We're all sitting in there. We're terrified. Um, I remember I had a bottle of tequila, very expensive tequila under the table that was going to be a gift. Oh. And I remember talking um, to my associate Gus at that moment. And we were going for plan B. It's like, we want to work with you. But if we can't do the Mir project, maybe we can launch a satellite together to the moon. So we had a plan B all ready to go. And, um, and then uh, Dr. Semenov, um basically said, and we we're passing these documents back and forth, and he said, okay, sign the document, and it was an MOU, right? And I'll sign it, and then he takes the date to put the paperwork together, cuts it in half, signs it, slips it over to us, stands up and shakes our hand. And, you know, we nearly wet our pants at that point. Um, it was amazing, and the problem was we had to come back to the U.S. and convince Walt to come back over, we had two weeks, well, two weeks, a few weeks, I should say, to make it all happen, and off we went. The rest is in the documentary, so you have to watch it. It's not a plot. I'm making no money on this. I know. <laughs> it's just I've seen the documentary, but it's, it's a good. <laughs> that's a good plug-in. <laughs> I'm just saving you an hour. I'm just saving you an hour. No, no, right? I, it's great. I love it. Please continue. I'm enjoying this. So anyway, what happened then um, was that we um, we got the project going. And the Mir Corp, and this isn't, part of this isn't in the documentary. Walt and I had a mega plan. As I told you, we were trying to get Mr. Zubrin, Bob, Mr. Zubrin, don't tell him I called him that. Um, <laughs> we were trying to get Bob to put pressure to go to Mars. And so Walt and I wanted to take Mir, renovate it, rehab it. And I remember we drew this on this paper napkin in LA. And the idea was that we would build Mir 2. We would start by um, doing satellite repairs and on orbit um, um, prep. In other words, you would send a satellite up to Mir that wasn't ready to go. The last pieces would be assembled in space. And I'll, I'll give you a visual. It's not exactly right, but it'll give you the idea. And the, the cosmonaut employee of Mir Corp would float out the airlock with the satellite, mm -hmm. manually spread the solar panels, check the last things, and give it a push. Because one of the things that was happening was uh, because of all the shaking and stuff that happens when you launch satellites, they might get to orbit and malfunction. Mm -hmm. So this way you would know it was working. And then we would work our way up to servicing satellites. And there was a little company at the time called Constellation Services. They were looking at this little pod right out of 2001, which I showed you here, uh, that would be able to go out and grab satellites and, and fix them and move them around. So we had all this multifaceted plan in place, and then we would work our way out to asteroids. And we even announced it at the beginning. And there's a whole story I can tell you about that because um, there was a... <laughs> a problem during the announcement and, and we didn't get to make the announcement so as we were doing Miracorp most people didn't know exactly what we were doing because the announcement uh fell apart is this the uh, deep mining deep space industries no this is something else 12 years before that oh this is 12 years before planetary resources and deep space this is 1998. Okay. um so we were we were bound and going in that direction Eventually, along the way, um, we realized uh, that the State Department wasn't going to let us fly this tether. Uh, we had to come up with other ways to make money. And we were thinking, well, maybe there's somebody who's got some money who wants to go to space. And that led to, uh, I was giving a briefing in LA, and there was a gentleman in the audience named Dennis Tito, 
Um, uh, he was interested. Uh, a great guy named John Spencer introduced us. Um, and uh, uh, Dennis and I had a couple of lunches. Uh, same phraseology. Would you like to go to space? I think we can do that. And uh, he put a deposit down and we were going to fly him on the mirror. Now, at the same time, I also met with a director named Jim Cameron, and he wanted to go and shoot a movie uh, in 3D, which is interesting, uh, in 98. Oh, wow. Um, and so we ended up uh, with a deposit to fly Dennis Tito. At the end of the day, the problem was, politically, it was very threatening to the US government that you had former Soviets and Walt Anderson, who was a bit of an anarchist, wanting to have their own space station. It was a threat to NASA and the newly created by NASA Russian Space Agency, which was created by NASA essentially, uh, because they were trying to sell, you know, the, the, the Grand Hyatt Regency, you know, and we were building the little, you know, well, in the US we call the Motel 6, <laughs> and it was a threat. And so between them, that put pressure on us. And then right in the middle of all of it, the dot-com bubble burst, the endowment collapsed, the funds that we were going to use to build the next stage went away. And so the patient was weak and we lost. But we were able to transfer Dennis Tito to the International Space Station. So he became the first what we uh, later uh, called spaceflight participant. I hate the word tourist. I actually really? testified in Congress <laughs> and said I do not like that word. I don't really like that word either. I, I like I yeah. like the term explorer, space explorer. Explorer, you know, look, there's a million ways in the commercial world. You could call them the customer. You could call them the guest. Yeah. You know, the one thing you'll notice that like uh, the Bahamas, or if you go to Majorca or whatever, they never call you a tourist. Hmm. They call you a guest. <laughs> it's, a, it's bad marketing to call somebody a tourist. You know, to me, a tourist is somebody in a Hawaiian shirt with a trail of Orangina bottles pissing on a monument. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not a glamorous idea. Um, so I, I fight that word wherever I can. I understand the tourism industry. I get that, you know, so. But anyway, I mean, I've spent a, a long time going through a very brief, that, that was, I just gave you the first 12 years. And it's really good to know how it all began because um, it, it leads us to where you are now. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd love to know what you're working on now and how you envision us um, in the future. What projects lie ahead for the space industry right. that you are right. actively participating in um, and the other thing I really want to know is what work is being done right now to bring Gerard's work alive, Gerard's mm -hmm. vision alive. Where is that now? Because it's been years um, and mm -hmm. I don't see any space colonies right now. So what's happening? Well, first, again, um, we had to pry the fingers of the aerospace establishment off mm -hmm. of, of the airlock. Right. So the rest of us could go through it. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned I had testified in 95. It only took us, what was it, uh, 20 years to get to SpaceX, carrying its first, you know, going on its first flight to station, roughly. Um, so, you know, look, one thing, and, and my friends remind me of this all the time, and I'll remind you, mm -hmm. historical change at the level we are speaking of mm -hmm. Can take a little while. A while. <laughs> no. A little while. Twenty-one years is still so long. <laughs> I know. So long, Rick. Bear with you. Cut uh, down to six months to a year, Mark. I know, and and but here's the point that I I think is uh, maybe encouraging, and that is the there's an incremental period where there's an assemblage coming together of the imaginations, the technologies that enable it, the financing that enables it. It all takes a while to coalesce. And then you hit, as Malcolm Gladwell calls it, the tipping point. Are we at the tipping point now? 
I think we're very, very close. I think um, that we are probably within five years of what history will see as the tipping point. I'll, I'll put it this way. This is for your Star Trek fans. If Elon Musk successfully flies the starship to orbit and back a few times, mm -hmm. that's when the Vulcans show up. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's when we have stepped into the universe and they come to welcome us or make sure we're not you know, crazy. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's when it happens. See, what we have to have is regular routine and eventually safe transportation to and from orbit. It's not, it's not about launch vehicles. It's not about the space industry. Mm -hmm. It's about a viable, commercially usable transportation system from Earth to space and back. Robert Heinlein, I'm badly paraphrasing him, um, said 100 miles up and you're halfway to anywhere. Okay, so right. when that happens, what is the next step? The next step after that, well, let me, I have a book coming out and, uh, and this is a plug. Okay. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> this is a plug. No, it's, uh, but in the book, I, I, I talk about several of these things and it, it's, it's not a biography like I just was doing, um, or, uh, I was there, uh, type thing. It's, there's three things, what I call three keys to opening the frontier. Mm -hmm. The first is the ability to get there and back regularly, rapidly, cheaply, and safely. Mm -hmm. And that's what SpaceX are focusing on right now. They're, they're focused on that entirely because again, it's the one, it's the big one. The second one is to have governments that either support you or stay the hell out of the way. And that's what you're focusing on. Uh, to some degree. I mean, now I'm doing the finance, but yeah, I still regularly butt heads with some of those folks or, or make gentle suggestions. Um, and then the third is the ability to utilize the resources of the place you're going to do anything you need to do. Who's doing that? Oh, well, <laughs> this is where the asteroid mining came in originally. Uh, my 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 brother Diamandis and planetary resources and then my own deep space industries uh we were a bit early uh but i can promise you that those ideas are not dead stay tuned some things may be happening in the next few months who knows uh, <laughs> like not, a plug. <laughs> not a plug at all <laughs> i know nothing i see nothing that's one reason for example that the major space government space programs are focused on the poles of the moon mm. right space resources isn't just about asteroids it's about water on the moon water is the gold of space liquids mm. Mm, what are you drinking there <laughs> definitely not water the <laughs> earth beverage we call <laughs> coffee i knew it <laughs> do you know if it's so possible to grow things on on mars or well on, or the moon, or even on asteroids, if we're going to have people mining asteroids and living and surviving on them. We know that we can grow things in space. We need to know more. Mm -hmm. One of the failings of the current space station is that it hasn't been designed as promised yeah. in a way that allows us to experiment on different kinds of gravity and, and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. But we will. We'll figure it out. Part of the onus now, part of the responsibility shifts somewhat to to Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and others who want to go out there and settle. Um, because if they're going to send people out there, they need to be responsible for helping understand what's going to happen to them there. What's going to happen? Will they be able to grow these crops? Mm -hmm. You know, um, will we, um, you know, will they be able to reproduce? Will we be able to have children? I mean, we, we have hours of episodes if you want to talk about these things someday, but I mean, it's, it's really a matter of uh, these kinds of uh, these kinds of questions have to be answered. Do you see SpaceX and um, uh, Jeff Bezos teaming up together anytime soon or are they going to be competitive? And it makes me very sad. It makes me very sad, but I don't see it. Why? I wish for it. Egos. Egos. There's this crazy thing. 
What about There's survival? This crazy thing what about survival, here? Rick? I'm with you. But there is this crazy little thing you may not have noticed that rich people and celebrities have egos. How do you tame that ego and bring it down? I don't, I, that's good. I would love to know, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't a lot of people. Um, it's not, I, and let me, let me clarify that because ego may be too harsh a word in some cases. There is a feeling, I think, sometimes from, from folks like those, those two gentlemen that they've got it handled. No, I've got this figured out. I haven't seen anything yet. I want to see I mean, action. I want to see things happening. All these tests that need absolutely. to be done, I want to see them now. We need to we yes, need to test the viability and and approve that so then things can start moving. You know, there's one thing um, that I would say to people in the U.S. that hmm. if you know, look. One thing that is hugely, absurdly, and almost obscenely ridiculous here in the U.S. is we have the the, the genius and the brilliance of the private sector um, working heavily on how to create that railroad to space. Whether it's Elon or one of the other 170 launch companies here in the U.S. or around the world. Why is the U.S. government then pouring billions of dollars into a project that's called the SLS, Space Launch System, and Orion. Why are they doing that? Um, I call it, by the way, I call it the Senate Launch System because it keeps money flowing to certain senators, mm -hmm. districts. Why would they do that to compete with these folks who are doing the job on their own for their own reasons and doing it better by far? If you're going to take tax dollars and do something with it to enable space, why not do exactly the kind of research that you're talking about? Well, exactly. The kind of it, it just, exactly. I don't get it. I don't get it. That's why I don't understand why it took so long for these acts to pass and for these experiments to happen, which haven't even happened yet, and for Jerry's vision, which hasn't happened. I'm saddened by that. I don't understand. Of course, of course, but you can't ever give up. Look, the world is not Mr. Spock. You know, Mr. Spock, um, you know, you make a logical point and he goes, I got it and we're going to do it. That's not how it works out there. And, and it's unfortunate, but that was, that's what I learned working in Washington and working on these other projects. There was so much to it. Now, if you roll in and you're one of the wealthiest people on the planet and you can just go for it, then you can. And that's what Elon's doing. And that's what I hope Jeff finally starts to do um, and, and really begins to get it together. Um, but again, I think we're just a few years from starting to see these tipping points. You say just um, a few years, and Gerard said it'd be in 1980s we'll see people colonizing space, and we're now in 2021. That's 40 right. years since his prediction, so I don't know if just a few years is going to turn out to be a few decades, and by then I believe it's going to be too late, and we may not Excellent. exist. So things need to move fast. Rick, what needs you to be done? You are exactly right. I know I'm right. I know, but what needs to be done? Yeah, intimate, a hundred percent, and I'm just loving this. It's like I'm looking at a uh, uh, a much more interesting reflection of myself here, hearing you say that. So, no, I'm <laughs> serious. It's it's. Look, here's the thing. As I said earlier, historical change takes a while to build up and to happen. Now, sometimes there could be a single event that does it. And um, but this is what's happening, and it's about to happen this time, I think. Why? Because the responsibility for doing it isn't now placed in a government that has an agenda that's different than our agenda. It is in the hands of people that largely share the same agenda. Whatever you say about Elon, however crazy he makes you, whatever you may think of him, if you're a fan or a detractor, he has the vision, and that's what I call Jerry's concept. He has I the like vision, him, capital V. Yeah. He has the vision, and he's doing it for his own purposes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one inter uh, interesting political thing going on right now is that NASA selected SpaceX to do their lunar landing system. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a bit troubling to me in one sense, because for years we had been fighting to make NASA hire multiple companies mm -hmm. 
for transportation of the space station. So they would compete and the cost would come down. So it's a bit troubling when they chose SpaceX as the sole provider of going to the moon for transportation. But then I had to pull myself back from my ideological position and look at it pragmatically. And the, the, the pragmatic point here is that Elon, for his own ideological, almost religious level set of beliefs, mm -hmm. is driven to bring the cost down himself. So there's two ways to do it. A, market forces, mm -hmm. or B, somebody whose entire goal is to do that thing that you need done. And that's what he's doing. He's doing it because he, in his soul, is driven to get people to Mars. We need to go to Mars. Well, I was going to say between you and me, even though I am uh, I'm drinking out of a Mars cup. Um, <laughs> drinking out of a wine glass. I don't. Oh, my God. Yeah, different time zones, I hope. <laughs> Great. Um, so if we were in the same time zone. You're doing that. I would recommend you to a certain program I know. <laughs> but anyway, if Elon can carry hundreds of people into space hmm. or thousands of people into space right now, I don't freaking care if he goes to Mars. As long as he's getting them into space. Hmm. And I'll use this example. If you look at, um, oh, look at this thing, right? This is an application development platform mm -hmm. disguised as a telephone. It used to be a telephone, remember? Um, now, what this is, it was largely developed using technologies, if you, if you include the internet in, in talking about this. Um, it, was used, it was largely created using government dollars, expenditures, and these kinds of things. There's a lot of components in here that came from government programs. Mm -hmm. But what did they do? They gave it to the people. They said, people, go do stuff with it. And look at what you can do now, right? Amazing things, you know, and it's basically a global brain. You can ask it any question. It will tell you anything. Now, look at the application development pro pro uh, platform that we have in space. For the entire human race, we have one space station. One. Not enough. No, it's not enough. And according to my friend, Bill Gerstenmeier, who used to run the space station, mm -hmm. Um, it takes about 2.75 people just to keep the lights on. Now, if you think about it, now there are a few extras up there right now, but normally it's between three and six people on the space station at any one time. I'm just talking about ours, the Chinese ways. We could have done several space stations. We could have. The thing is, and if you think about it, if it takes 2.75 people to keep the lights on, and half of the year there's only three people up there, or maybe six, that means that one quarter of one person's time or three and a quarter of, of a person's time mm -hmm. is available for all of the daydreaming, IP creation, experimentation, science, etc. All the rest of their time is just keeping the station operating. And that represents access to the entire universe for the human species. This is why if Elon or Jeff or you know, Mary or Pete or whoever it is can figure out how to build that railroad to space to put more mines out there. That's the key. That is the key. So we make that jump, we get that railroad, we get that airline like service to and from space, and everything else becomes possible. I know you've spoken to some of my friends that are working on other parts of the equation. Yeah. My friend uh, Dan Faber, who was with yeah. me, right, um, was still tall. Um, who was with me uh, with Deep, uh, Deep Space Industries. Now he's working on basically putting gas caps on satellites so they can be refueled mm. using space resources. So he's working on that next stage, right? There are all these other projects going on that as we get this transportation thing handled, it all starts to break loose. So that's the key. And I want to agree with you on one point, mm -hmm. on, on your major point. It has to happen now. It has to happen now. We don't have much time, Rick. Do not. We absolutely do not. And and it's it's scarier than people realize. I just I know. Tweeted. It's really scary and a lot of people don't want to believe it. No. It's easier not to. It's it's really easier not to believe or not to pay attention to something that you feel you personally can't do anything about. So if we look at what's happening with climate change, for example. Mm. Right. Um, and I just tweeted on it this morning. Um, there's a study that came out that shows that 
faster than we thought. We're about to hit the 1.5 degree increase centigrade. It really starts to push us in a bad place. I know this yeah. is, I knew this was going to happen. The earth yeah. exploration data suggests really, really alarming um, yeah. things. So I, I just, oh, we need to turn that into mainstream news as well. There needs to be an act for that to pass so that all broadcasters um, and news channels will report this. This needs to be mainstream news. This needs to be in the forefront of people's consciousness. Why hasn't anyone figured that out yet? Well, there are people that have figured it out, but we have a we have a very strange set of situations going on right now. The the very we're going off space for a moment, but the very access to information that we is so important to us that we get through the internet also allows access to idiots and their opinions. And what happens is um, there's a it's a great equalizer, which is important. We need that, but that means that there are people out there in the world who are saying basically stupid stuff like the earth is flat <laughs> the earth is flat the vaccine will kill you um i won't get into the politics but you know what i mean and and it's insane and and so what happens is um there's this whole denial you know there are people a significant number of people here in the u.s for example who um are not willing to get a shot in their arm that may save their life right now what you're talking about is them changing their entire lifestyle so three generations from now, their children can live a wonderful life. So think about that. They won't even give a shot to change their life now. And you're trying to get them to think about the future. So what do we do about that? Well, along with increasing the amount of science education in school, those of us who do get it have to work harder we have to work faster, we have to work smarter, and we have to communicate our message more effectively as to what it is we are about and why that's this is that's missing. That's what's missing. The oh. message isn't communicated enough and effectively besides yourself and very few like you. Actually, I don't know anyone else like you. <laughs> it's probably a blessing, but we're going to go with it. In the book, I talk about the fact that we're approaching the end of the most hundred, most important hundred years in the history of humanity. If we even get that much time. Yeah. Well, I'm saying 2040. <clears throat> if we haven't turned the ship, we could end up like Venus. Yeah. All right. Now, there's some people who are like, well, you know, there's here, or, uh, the human civilization may fail, but the Earth will keep going. No, no. I'm not talking about you know, vines and animals taking over downtown Manhattan after the human race is gone. I'm talking about a dead, burning planet with no life on it whatsoever. This is not some Earth abides scenario of, of, of that, of nature reclaiming the Earth. We're killing the planet. We will kill the planet dead unless we change not just how we operate in this in this bubble <clears throat> in this spaceship but why we do the things we do how we educate our children as to what their role is in this how we measure value with each other you know is, is it are we going to shift from how many internal combustion engines you have in your driveway to how many teslas you have in your driveway right that's not really the way we need to be going we need to be looking at life and and our interactions with our each other and the universe as, as something greater, grander, more important, more valuable a gift than we do now. And we have to understand that we are here for a purpose. What's we are purpose, here. Right? My purpose? Mm. Um, my purpose is to delve into and try and understand why we're here to try and lead the best life I can, of course. Of course, to take care of my, my beautiful eight-year-old daughter's future. But it's also to try and explain to people, in my own words, using my own way of speaking, um, in, in the hopes that one out of X number of people who hear what I'm saying will get it themselves, translate it into their own way of being, their own hearing, their own listening, as we call it, and then manifested in what they're doing in their lives so that we can make this change. 
But as to the purpose of humanity, I believe that humanity has a grand purpose. And I break that down into the, what I call the three principles of purpose. The first is to protect and advance human civilization. I come from the premise that human beings are basically good. We just haven't figured out how to be human beings yet. We've only been at this for a few hundred thousand years, really. We don't know what to do with this thing called consciousness. You know, we're still apes with sticks. You know, the sticks are shiny now and, and, and we drive them, we shoot them, we, we do things with them, but we're still apes with sticks. We haven't figured out what to do. So do you think if we expand our consciousness, because I feel a big spiritual shift happening on the planet now, um, mm -hmm. and it's going to be ever more present than I've ever seen in my life, um, having spoken to a lot of people, uh, do you think through expanding our consciousness, we'll become more aware, um, we'll become more elevated as a human being? And that yes. will allow us to then work together, shift our focus um, and our efforts to where it needs to be. And essentially that will then open up the space frontier even more so. Yes, so still in the first principle here, but that's exactly right, right? Because when I say protect and, and advance human civilization, mm -hmm. the advance part is what's critical. Where do we go to try the next step after democracy? Where do we go? Well, I'll put it this way. There's one place in the entire solar system that we know of where Russians and Americans and people from other countries share basically a one room building and don't just care about each other, but actually develop love for each other. And it's 100 miles up in space. It's a perfect model of how we can become one family. Essentially, that's the blueprint we need to model if we're going to populate the world for the solar system. There is so much that we do as we go out there hmm. that operates as a model, a cultural model. And this is something that our leaders need to understand and why they should endorse and support what it is we're doing in space. Why aren't they understanding this? I don't understand. <laughs> I'm figuring this out in my sleep. What's wrong <laughs> with our leaders? Why do they not understand this? Why haven't they done anything about this yet? We need to be better at communicating it. And I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up the two other principles and then we can talk a little more about that. But the other two principles very quickly um, are to defend and expand the domain of life. Mm -hmm. That ties into climate change, how we interact with living systems, etc. I want to go one step beyond the environmentalists. Mm -hmm. I want to out environmental the environmentalists. All right. And I am one, by the way. I was the annoying kid, was a volunteer for Greenpeace. <laughs> and the nice lady would try and close the door on and, and I would stick my foot <laughs> in the door and I would be, don't you care about the whales? That was me. So I, I got to tell you, though, that um, what we're looking at here is is bigger than just saving the earth. And forgive my wording, but I want to trump the environmentalists. I want to go one step beyond in a big way. I don't want to just save the patient. I want the patient to run a marathon. In other words, I want to take the life of the mother world and carry her seeds to places that are now dead. I want that to become the mission of humanity. I want that to be something that we as a culture, rather than the acquisition of wealth and material goods, come from. That's where we come from. Rather than evangelizing uh, uh, religions or, or, or other things, that our self-identity as a human species is that we are here to go out there. And the third principle is, is the fun part of that, because I believe that we should explore and experience everything there is in the universe. Those are the three principles of purpose. You put those together now, and you make that sort of an underlying basis for why how we should operate as a civilization. And then you project that 500 years in the future. I think it's pretty amazing. 500 years is too long. <laughs> oh, I mean, once we're really good at it. I mean, you know, that's if you were looking back from 500 years at a culture that had that as yeah. its basis.
Yes. Okay. And it might be quite beautiful. And I'll, I'll put this another way for you. Mm. Um, and again, you're catching me as I'm finishing the book, so it's in my head. I'm just, you know, editing in my brain. But imagine, imagine a scene, and this is this is to my friends in the movement, mm -hmm. right? This is to my friends in the revolution, what I call the space revolution, or or the frontier movement. Um, it's to me, it's not about an industry. It's not even about uh, we you know we made up a word a long time ago about new space. Those are the engine. That's the engine. Right? You can't mistake the engine of the vehicle with Disneyland. You're in the vehicle to go to Disneyland. Don't get the two confused, mm -hmm. right? The aeros the, the aeros I was about to say aerospace. Good gosh. The <laughs> industry, the new space industry has the job of carrying us to this amazing frontier. We have to understand that we are in a position that nobody has ever been in in the history of humanity. Never, zero, nada. Nobody has ever been in a place like this. So I'll give you a, an image, a, a, a word image of it. So for example, imagine we're standing on the edge of the universe. And we're all lined up there. All right. And, um, you know, and there's Elon, and Jeff, and, uh, and, and Sarah, and, you know, and, and um, you know, everybody, Dan Faber and uh, my partner, Megan, and all of us are lined up there who are believers in this frontier. And ahead of us lies this amazing, uh, what they call you know, the undiscovered country of the universe. Mm -hmm. It's all out there waiting for us. It's this frontier. And we're standing on the edge of it. And we are the ones who have the ability to make that crossing with the rest of humanity following us. And we can stand in this place, and for the first time in the history of humanity, we have the ability to look backwards with clear eyes at what our history was like. And it is the first time. This is the reason we're having issues here in the United States, like Black Lives Matter and all of this, because we're starting to see our history from more than one, through more than one lens. We're Do starting to understand perspectives. her colonial. We're learning every, every culture in the world right now, the young people, using this connectivity and the ability to understand things and get knowledge from multiple places are looking at their own histories and going, oh, that's not what I was told. Oh, right. And so we can look at that. Right. Yeah, that's not right. You know, and, and, and so we can look at that history with clear eyes and say, okay, that's where we came from and how we did it before. We burned down the forest. We took lands from people much to their uh, chagrin who are being discovered, you know, <laughs> well, I've already been living here. I didn't know I was being discovered, you know, I mean, it's all of these kinds of things going on, right? And then we can look forward into this future that we're about to create through the eyes of science fiction, through science, um, and, and through multiple eyes of multiple cultures, multiple people coming from this multiple past, look forward into this. And for the first time together, we can make the right choice. We can say to each other, how can we get it right this time? What can we do now to make sure that we apply all of these lessons, that we bring all of these people with us, that we take these beautiful, amazing plants, and I have a window out here with trees, and, and, and we can bring them with us. We can take the eyes and imaginations of humanity to places that are unexplored. We can take the seeds of life and plant them in places that are now dead. We can do all of this for the first time together. That's what's exciting about this moment. That's the possibility that we have. And, and I want to say thank you for you. I just want to give you a compliment and, and thank you. Um, I can feel your passion. I can feel your commitment. I can feel your frustration. Maybe a little anger in there which is good because you can channel that in a good way. And what I urge you and, and any of your viewers and those who, who probably follow you to do is, as I just said, channel it. Channel it forward, right? Get this message out. And we have to get it out to different groups of people, depending on what your skill set is, too. We can't all do everything. Um, now, I've tried to do everything and I've, you know, kind of done a mediocre job at most of it. But what I'm suggesting is, you know, if, if you have an ability to speak to your political people, go speak to them about this vision. If you have the ability to invest, 
feel free to invest. And yes, you can call me, I will help you. Um, that's my current job. Um, but I got that plug in because my partner is going to be, but you didn't mention the company. <laughs> Space Fund. Space Fund. We're a venture capital company. You and have Earth Light Foundation. Foundation. Space. Earth Light Foundation is a not for profit that is kind of wrapped around the principles that are going to be in the book, the principles of purpose. There's a declaration I'm trying to get people to look at called the Space Declaration, which lays out these ideas. Um, but also, just take your skill set, right? And don't take ignorance for an answer. Ignorance is a chance for you to then go in and educate people, to enroll them in the excitement of what it is we're about. Oh, I don't take ignorance. No. I mean, it's a difference between ignorance and willful, willful ignorance. I mean, if somebody who just doesn't know, educate. then you get in the conversation. Educate them. Yes, exactly. It's an opportunity. There's a, uh, a course that I've taken and my friend uh, Loretta Hidalgo and Diamandis and all of us have taken. It's called Landmark um, and I heavily recommend it to anybody who can, uh, can sign up for it. It's a life changing. It's, it's, it was after Landmark that I decided to make this my life, for example. Um, and in it, it talks about enrolling. So enrolling isn't trying to convince somebody. It is offering them an opportunity to engage in a new conversation, a new way of being that leaves them excited, that leaves them called and, and brings forth the, their, their better part of their being. And so let's go out and enroll people in this, right? Okay, people will be saying like, oh, that Elon, he's a crazy guy and he's manipulating the Bitcoin thing. Yeah. I don't think he's crazy at all. I well, think I mean, you know, you got to, I'm going to give them room for that. I'm going to say, look, you know what? He has kind of screwed up the whole Bitcoin thing. Great, fine. But you know what? Over here, this is what he's doing. And this is going to change humanity. Exactly. Well, people right. need to focus on the good stories. Unfortunately, the good storylines don't really make for great press. And so journalists don't get paid. But that needs to turn on its head because it's the good stories that give people hope. And hope is what we need to instill in the hearts of humanity to keep us pushing forward for the greater vision. So let's just project uh, uh, 50 years, and you're talking about journal looking for stories. Okay, so let's say at that point we have people fanning out through the solar system. Mm -hmm. Now your news at night starts to get pushed into, we're opening the cave on the surface of the moon, we're about to see what's inside. We're getting a report back from the surface of Mars, and this is happening. Oh, we've got the first baby born in a habitat in space. We start creating a new level of kinds of news that is positive and uplifting rather than how many people died this morning in a gun exactly, shoot. Exactly, exactly. But I still right. think 50 years is too long. <laughs> it needs to happen now! <laughs> no! Beat me up, Scotty. I'm tired. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rick. I really, really appreciate you uh, being on the Space Down and giving me your insight and great, great story and um, great information. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I, I look forward to doing it again sometime. I, I only made 12 years of history there, so we've got a lot more to talk about. Oh, we'll, we'll do that. We'll catch someday. up. <laughs> someday. Someday. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a beautiful evening.